Hi everyone, I'm Gabriela Mercuri, Managing Director at Scope Europe, and today I'm thrilled to host this conversation, which is actually a celebration because we have quite a few milestones to commemorate this month. First of all, of course, we are about to reach the 60 year mark since GDPR became applicable. And next to that, we are also celebrating the third approval anniversary of the EU Cloud Code of Conduct, as well as the third accreditation anniversary of Scope Europe as the code's dedicated monitoring body. And in this context, considering how symbolic these dates are to the privacy community, and of course, more precisely to the cloud community, I could not be in better company, as today I'm going to be talking to Mr. Pierce O'Donoghue, Director for Future Networks at DigiConnect. Welcome, Piers, and thank you very much for taking the time to discuss, go over, evaluate this journey, this implementation journey of GDPR, and really take a look at the lessons learned so far and see how we can leverage this experience to optimize our upcoming efforts uh, to further expand, strengthen, and harmonize compliance across the EU. With that being said, I will segue to my first question, which was pretty straightforward, but this was actually hard. It was a hard exercise to narrow it down because there are so many interesting, important developments going on right now, but uh, we won't keep you here the whole, <laughs> the whole afternoon. So the first question, again, very straightforward. In your experience over the past years, exchanging with several stakeholders on GDPR and its implementation, what do you believe are the biggest challenges for properly implementing GDPR, the, the pain points and the persistent ones? Thank you, yes. Um, well, that is a question and a conversation that we have to deal with a lot over the years. Uh, and I would say particularly dealing with the cloud community, but even in a wider context of digital supply, is the relative complexity as it is viewed from the enterprise point of view, particularly small companies, where there is a lot that they have to do in order to comply fully. And it does impose a burden, particularly on smaller companies, but even larger companies, which requires a certain expertise and which also creates great nervousness because of the perceived risk of significant compliance cost, even fines and regulatory intervention, if a provider of any cloud service is considered not to be fully respecting the um, GDPR. And then, of course, that extends into the users of cloud services, the uh, users of digital services who are themselves, in some cases, the data owners, but certainly processors of a large amount of personal data, whether it's client databases, human resource personnel data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are sometimes relying on third party providers, but they are also very nervous about their compliance responsibilities. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we have to be clear that very, very many companies in Europe aren't just doing it because they know they have to be compliant. They're doing it because they do actually believe in the protection of data, but they see that it is something which has um, a potential downside. Uh, there can be ne negative consequences if they don't get it right. So over the six years of the GDPR, even before it came into force, it was obvious through the conversations that we were having was that we had to find ways of simplifying where possible the, uh, the implementation, making it easier for the average company in any sector, not necessarily the digital sector, but also those the providers of digital services to make it possible for them to provide a service that was compliant, to have some assurance that that was the case, uh, and then, of course, to give confidence to the public, to smaller companies that they were actually uh, protecting data and having their data protected. So I would say that was the first big challenge that has been the underlying thread throughout. Thank you very much. No, this was a great summary. And indeed, you already touched on upon a few points that are quite important because there were a lot of things, a lot of those challenges that you've described indeed you were aware from the beginning. And this is why GDPR already puts forward um, 
a toolkit, let's say, to support implementation um, of its provisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is crucial, and it's, I always like to emphasize the word support. And to be more precise and, and quote, it's about specifying the requirements because there's a lot of misconception when we talk about codes of conduct and self and co-regulatory tools, uh, industry standards, however you want to call it. A lot of people would think it's something to replace the regulation or to go beyond and not necessarily. GDPR puts forward a very robust framework with Article 40 and 41 for codes of conduct. And it's all about translating those vague provisions because they were made as a one-size-fits-all approach uh, to materialize those provisions on a day-to-day -day on a specific processing context. And this is, has great added value if properly uh, implemented. And the processes also are very robust. The approval process, especially for transnational codes of conduct, I need to go through the ADPB and for national ones as well. You have quite intense exchange also between the industry and national data protection authorities, which is very, very important to find common ground and understand daily challenges and be able to tackle them. With that being said, what do you believe can be the role of codes of conduct and certifications in the optimization of GDPR implementation? Well, um, it was clear to us that there needed to be some intermediaries in what was, as I've said, a complex process, but also one that would help to harness the, the goodwill, that would help to harness the technological or technical capacity and understanding uh, of many providers and many companies, which we as regulators or bureaucrats, if you like, uh, don't have. Uh, so it was to allow that to be expressed, so it was a two-way conversation. Um, and it was also to demystify parts of the GDPR. So even in the way that I spoke in reply to your first question, sometimes we can be seen, we find ourselves maybe always speaking as if the GDPR was a problem. Uh, it certainly proposed, uh, presented challenges, but we have to go back to first principles. It was a very bold uh, and clear decision by the European Union, by its member states with the Commission, to assert the primacy of the protection of the individual, uh, which is already obvious in our treaties, but needed to be given effect to specifically with the growth of data uh, technologies uh, and online uh, services and technologies. Now, it was new for all of us. And that's why there was a certain amount of um, accretion of different elements into what became this very, very large and complex piece of legislation. So inevitably, we were all going to be learning together. And then when it came to asking ourselves the question that you just asked me now, it was clear that we could, first of all, maintain at a higher level of principles in the legislation uh, and have instruments which would be more flexible and adaptable, but which would also speak to the users or the providers of data services, but to, to the users in general in a way that would help them implement but also could be amended, uh, would be more flexible perhaps than, than, than whatever review process we're now uh, launching into with regard to the GDPR. And uh, the other key issue, and now focusing on the cloud code of conduct, was of course we can have a, a number of codes of conduct. We can have them sector by sector, activity by activity, uh, which make them more relevant to specific activities and sectors, specific user groups, uh, different companies. Uh, and not have to go through every single article, uh, every single paragraph of the GDPR, when in some cases some of those provisions are less relevant to a given sector, as was the case in cloud. So that's that's the first uh, real example. But of course it's a feedback process. And as I said, we all started off in this adventure with a massive piece of legislation and we were all at, um, uh, at the same stage of, of learning. Uh, it meant that we got feedback from from providers of cloud services, from large users of cloud services and small companies, users of cloud services, that increased our own technical understanding about how cloud works, how 
data services actually work. And of course, they are constantly evolving as well. The technology is radically different from what it was six years ago when the GDPR actually entered into force, and certainly when we made the initial proposal. So that's one of the benefits of having this more flexible method. It is that we all learn and we can be adaptable and more flexible. Great, great. And um, indeed, I think one of the main um, main topics when we talk about cloud specifically is exactly the complexity, right? And the added value that some tools can have exactly to translate this complex reality and to facilitate the risk assessment, especially for those companies that are looking to onboard cloud services, but struggle to understand and understand this whole world also of standards, which in itself is quite complex. So to facilitate uh, and to create ways of clearly uh, proving and demonstrating compliance can be very, very important for, especially for, for SMEs, not only on the provider side when we're talking about the cloud industry, because obviously if you're setting technical and organizational measures that European Data Protection Authority said, this is great, this is sufficient, and this is appropriate, this is extremely helpful for those that don't have a huge compliance department uh, to, to check if their implementation is really compliant. So with that being said, knowing that there are benefits uh, clearly for these tools, although this is not a silver bullet, of course, and as you mentioned, the scope can vary. The flexibility is very welcome on the one hand, but it also creates complexity when it comes to what do you do if you have several codes of conduct, right, with different scopes within the same sector, across sectors, why not? There is no, nothing that says that a code of conduct cannot be cross-sectoral, and this can also increase that complexity. However, uh, again, not a silver bullet, but in any case, it can create important benefits, it can support proper um, implementation. And then my question would be, knowing those benefits, why do you believe there are very few examples? At the national level, there are already quite few examples after six years of uh, GDPR being applicable. And on the transnational level, we know there are only a couple. So why do you believe it's taking so long for these tools to gain traction, considering those challenges and how we can help? Mm -hmm. They can help tackling those. Well, there are many parts to the answer. <laughs> and again, uh, we could spend all day on that. Um, first of all, the short answer to the start of this whole uh, episode is that everyone was getting used to the GDPR. And, uh, the first steps were relatively tentative. The second point was that because of the overall framework of the GDPR, which empowers national data protection authorities with a significant power individually and then also collectively in the Data Protection Board, uh, codes of conduct were understandably not top of their priority list when it came to implementation. They had an awful lot to work through in the early days. But secondly, there was a certain nervousness among the regulators to, in what would be seen as an ex-ante way, somehow give a carte blanche, now they didn't necessarily use that language, or to give a license to, to, to act uh, to, to a sector or a group of companies when the issues that arose in that sector may not necessarily have been fully understood by the uh, regulators themselves. So it was quite a slow start and uh, as you in scope know because you accompanied us in the process of working with industry, uh, we were one of the first uh, but also therefore one of the guinea pigs to a certain extent. Now we don't regret that process because we learned an awful lot as did the cloud industry. But it, it, first of all that's why it was a slow start. The second point is that we have realized in a number of sectors including those not in, at all covered by data protection, but I could refer later on perhaps to cloud switching, which is portability and switching of cloud services. It's another area in which we have worked hard with the industry and user groups with regard to codes of conduct, is that if you have conflicting commercial interests, it's very hard for a group of companies, a sector, 
uh, to sit down and bear all in front of their competitors, but also in some cases perhaps to agree to standards or to practices which may be more beneficial to one company than another, depending on their business model. Uh, and that proved also to be uh, a problem. Uh, and the third is actually what you said. It's then that in some cases there are conflicting, uh, no, competing, I think is a better word, uh, groups uh, working on, on uh, codes of conduct, which means that in some cases, even when they get to the end of the process and may seek uh, data protection board approval under Article 4041, uh, the board itself doesn't quite know, well, why this one and not another one? which is viable, which is legitimate or representative? And is it not going to confuse your average data owner if they see certification of two different schemes, which is the one that they want? So that's that, I would say, would be several of the explanations that we have been able to identify. The last one, though, does also have to look to the user because um, the expectations of data protection are such that there has been some nervousness among potential user groups uh, who would benefit from the codes, but in other words, seek to benefit from the services being offered, but really need to know if a certain service complies with their own regulatory obligations under the GDPR. Uh, and that lack of transparency, or at least lack of information, lack of knowledge, linked often to simply a lack of compliance resource. An SME uh, hiring less than 10 people is very unlikely to have a, a lawyer, let alone a data protection regulator, until such times they are told, by the way, under the GDPR, you are actually supposed to be appointing um, a data protection officer. Uh, and that is why we had to take steps uh, in order to overcome that. So I think the accumulation of some of those reasons I've given, and I'm sure there are other explanations as well, um, uh, would explain why we have so, so relatively few. But I have to also say is that it is a complex process which requires serious commitment from those who wish to follow that path. Uh, and that we saw with the industry group who worked with us and then became owners, as it were, of what became the Code of Conduct, uh, that they made a serious commitment in resources, but also in reputation, in order to work out a text which was both meaningful, but also, shall we say, practicable in their sector. Thank you, Piers. That was, um, yeah, that was extremely helpful. And again, another great summary. And in this regard, um, would you be able to perhaps explore a little bit more what kind of efforts, um, considering the challenge to harmonize interpretation of GDPR across different member states, could you dig in a little bit more and tell us what kind of efforts uh, the Commission is focusing on in order to tackle this challenge in particular? Well. I will largely only be able to speak about uh, the cloud and, of course, our colleagues in DG Justice uh, who are responsible for coordination have, have greater experience. But it is certainly that we realised our starting point is already different in different member states who had upon entry into force of the GDPR, but then also uh, the arrival three years ago of uh, the cloud code of conduct that they had different expectations, even different experiences of dealing with what we at the time would still have called uh, self-regulation or co-regulation. Uh, some member states have no experience uh, or familiarity with that, even though it was written to the text of the GDPR. Uh, and so we had to help some member state uh, authorities to, to understand how this um, fitted into the overall regulatory structure on which they, as the National Data Protection Authority, of course, had primary responsibility. Uh, and that was a process that took some time. Uh, there were also reflections which sometimes uh, based or were based on whether that particular country had a strong native cloud industry or not. And first of all, we have to start from the fact that Europe, unfortunately, 
as a whole does not have a very strong native cloud industry. We are still significantly dependent on services from third country providers, a very important service, but one that is therefore headquartered elsewhere. Uh, and that brought its own elements of difficulty with regard to the GDPR. But in substance, it meant that uh, some authorities, like some uh, ministries with responsibility for digital affairs, were very much used to dealing with a very small number of non-national companies, whereas one or two member states had a very dynamic uh, population of small native and certainly European providers coming forward with advanced cloud services, software services, etc. So that difference in market, that difference in experience did lead to, to the need not so much to add further harmonization, but to come to a common understanding as to what the market was and as to how the code of conduct would work. Uh, and that even went so far as to what is the information available in what language to a medium-sized company with a lot of personal data who need to go to the cloud market. They see the certification scheme, but there's still a gap, an information gap as to how that applies, how that is helpful to them, helps them to meet their re regulatory obligations, but will also be accepted by the national authority as a result. So that was another period which, as I said at the start, we were to a certain extent guinea pigs. Uh, I think it was worth it because we have now, with the Code of Conduct, a scheme which has proven its worth uh, and which has also helped us and the Commission as a whole to reflect on what might be elements that we could perhaps uh, make some small improvements to as we go forward with the GDPR uh, for other Codes of Conduct in other uh, sectors because it is, as we said at the start, something that's very useful to the industry, very useful to users. Thank you very much. And indeed, I always like to, to highlight this because often when we look at the journey of the cloud CUC specifically, it started actually in 2012 under the commission by Corneli Cruz was there. Uh, and it was a long process until we reached the approval. Of course, GDPR came in the middle. It was originally drafted against the directive. So long journey, almost a decade. But in any case, it was, it was about creating that mutual understanding. And it, it does take a lot of effort. You're talking about asymmetries. There's so many different levels at the member state level, but within the industry and coming back to all the challenges that you mentioned and considering the complexity of the cloud environment and as well as Article 28, because sometimes people also look at the code and think like, oh, it's just one article and it's related articles, so that's simple. No, it's basically covering how processing activities is actually extremely complex to reach the consensus on, on so many levels. Therefore, I fully agree, of course, I'm a little bit biased, but fully agree that uh, this was worth... Well, uh, you're not as biased as I am, because <laughs> the little secret you need to know is that I was working directly with Nadia Cruz voilà. in 2013 when we received the Ilves report, the high-level group report, which was what started this process. And I've been working uh, with different hats on, but I've been working on this ever ever since um, in, in the cloud unit and now running the Future Networks Directorate. So it has been a long process. It has been painful. Some companies, some efforts have fallen by the wayside in the meantime. And of course, all of those efforts had to adapt to what is a significantly different cloud market from what we envisaged it in, in, in 2013. Um, but that's actually, again, why the process, just it stresses why the process of having codes of conduct is so important. Because at the end of the day, they can be, now that they are embedded and we have the experience, they can be adapted more quickly then we in Brussels are able to adapt legislation that requires the agreement of all the member states. So that's why it's such an important tool. Um, and I think we were going to touch on harmonization. It's that it can also then act again in this feedback way to, well, here is a new challenge because there's a new service uh, which um, needs to be addressed, may not be properly addressed in what is the current provisions of the code, but can certainly be done, uh, can be covered if we have industries sitting down and working in the same way as they have done in the past. Uh, of course, the output has to be independently 
audited, as it were, and that's why the approval of the board is so important. But with the confidence of the board approval, then industry can proceed ahead. Uh, and, and that leads to uh, an acceleration, in fact, of the ability to adapt to uh, current technology. It means that uh, this and future regulation can remain at a higher level of principles. The principles of the GDPR are essential because they come from the treaty, as I've said. But if we can leave some of the technical implementation to this form of self-regulation and co-regulation with proper scrutiny, with proper oversight by, in this case, the Data Protection Board, then we have reached a situation in which the internal market can develop along with the technology and regulation can develop at the same time. And that's really the, 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 the sweet spot where we want to get. Truly, truly. And uh, yeah, it's the last question. I know I told you I wouldn't keep you here the whole afternoon, so I promise is the last one. But talking about ways to mitigate this complexity and some important developments that are also highly anticipated, could you wrap it up perhaps talking a little bit about uh, the state of play of the cloud rulebook as well as the Commission's guideline on public procurement for cloud? Yes. Certainly. Uh, we, we felt it increasingly necessary to actually, again, make our contribution to this issue of transparency and information. So we, uh, we have ready uh, a, a cloud rulebook, which, in case people get nervous, is not a new set of rules. It is actually simply a, a consolidation of existing rules and best practice, so very much the code of conduct as part of that, to help cloud providers and cloud users. Uh, data service users to understand what are the various pieces of regulation, how they fit together, what are the obligations uh, they need to meet, but also how to how do you do that? The code of conduct is obviously an important one. Uh, to whom need you address yourself uh, at national or European level, and so on. So that is to it to be a living document. Uh, we have recently had important provisions, for example, on the Data Act. Uh, including also the AI Act, very recent pieces of European legislation, but which do now provide us with elements. I mentioned before cloud switching in this domain. So it's one of the, the, the areas now where we have law as well as um, uh, industry agreements to give backing to those procedures. So that is, um, uh, we hopefully, a useful tool. One specific area which has been um, not focused on sufficiently is that of procurement. Because one of our mandates, one of our goals, and again, we're talking about a 10-year process, is to ensure that public services, government and local authorities, in other words, the public sector, is also migrating massively to cloud, away from on-premises um, resources because of the security issues and the cost issues, but also particularly in order to provide more agile services to the citizen. Um, if, if we have a move to online services. But all that means that there's a significant public sector regard to cloud. And of course, any public authority, any government, uh, any department of government has a particular uh, responsibility to protect the data of its citizens. And that's why the GDPR elements are so important. So that is why uh, we want to provide uh, guidelines specifically on public procurement, not just about data protection, but actually also about security uh, with regard to efficiency um, in order to allow uh, public sector purchasers of cloud and data services to also be at, uh, at a, an advanced level of understanding. Um, I have to also mention that we are working on a European Union cloud certification scheme for cybersecurity, uh, which has proven to be a difficult process. Uh, again, we have some different views between member states, but also we ha have a rapidly advancing industry, a rapidly advancing technology, which increases the pressure points, the potential areas of vulnerability in the cloud system that do need to be addressed because of, of uh, cybersecurity risks. Uh, and we hope with those three elements, the toolbox, the guidelines on procurement, and the cloud certification, that we will be playing our part again in keeping European industry and users of data services up to speed and well protected on data protection and cybersecurity. 
Thank you very much, Piers. This was extremely insightful for the Cloud UC community, Scope Europe's community as well, and also all the enthusiasts when it comes to codes of conduct out there. We hope it's a growing audience in that sense. And again, to our audience, many thanks for, for being here today. And should you be interested to learn more about these initiatives, do not hesitate to reach out to Scope Europe via our website. Thank you and see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>